Hey guys, this is Bryn with the Mama on the Rocks, and I'm here with Amy Smith with Solstice Nutrition, and she is going to talk to us about, um, she is basically a certified everything healthy coach, that's what I like to call her. Um, she is married to a chef, which is kind of like the most amazing pairing of all time, and every time she posts pictures of what they eat, I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope she never sees what, what we're <laughs> cooking, um, but uh, she is an extreme parent. And we've actually had her on here before to talk to us about healthy eating for um, extreme children, especially those who have specialized diets um, or need to stay away, kind of um, elimination diets. You know, they tell us a lot of times, oftentimes as parents, we'll take kids to OT or to specialists and they'll suggest we try to eliminate certain things. Um, so Amy's been on here to help us before. And so today I think we all can agree with COVID, everything is crazy. And as parents, I feel like we're pretty much at our limit with <laughs> maintaining our own health and sanity. And so I asked Amy to come on and kind of talk to us a little bit about what we need to do to maintain our own sanities as moms, um, especially as we're kind of in the season of what feels like to me, um, like decision fatigue. Like we're just making what feels like life or death decisions <laughs> like 10 times a day and it's too much. Um, yeah. So Amy, talk to us a little bit. I know you um, started Solstice Nutrition and you guys also had done these food tours, but then that was kind of put on hold because COVID has put a damper on everything. So talk right. to me a little bit about what you guys offer and what you specialize in because it's such a, a niche market that is so specific to extreme parenting and extreme children. Yeah, so um, I live in Abingdon, Virginia and we started Solstice Nutrition at the beginning of the year. Um, I had originally just opened it as like a regular nutrition counseling service, but as things progressed with COVID, I kind of started moving towards the mental health sector of that. Um, so I work with a lot of people that have anxiety, depression, um, eating disorders, um, ADHD, a lot of extremely stressed out people and really just um, approach mental health from not only you know, the, you know, like meditation and things like that, but also from the nutrition aspect. Um, we were going to get, get started on some food tours and then COVID kind of knocked that out of the plan. We're still going to do that next year, but um, right now we're just really focusing on this mental health area. So I'm doing a lot of work with intuitive eating and um, basically just trying to help people deal with the stress of, that comes with coronavirus. So social isolation, um, the decisions we have to make every single day, which are right. getting harder. So talk to us, I've seen your posts about intuitive eating and it's something that's really interesting to me. Can you kind of talk about what that is and how that can help us sort of maintain a, a balance? Because I know something that you're really passionate because I know about being friends with you, that you're really passionate about kind of treating it as whole body wellness and not as like going on and off of these diets right. and just kind of making it your lifestyle. So talk to us a little bit about that idea of intuitive eating and how that can maybe help us with our sanity. Sure. So intuitive eating is basically an anti-diet approach to health. And it also follows the health at every size movement. So there's this, you know, idea in the medical world that if you're overweight, that automatically means you're unhealthy. And now we have the science to back the point that that's not true. Just because you're, you know, in a larger body size doesn't mean you're naturally going to have high blood pressure or heart disease. These things that they used to think you would have if you were in a larger body size. Sure. So intuitive eating is really just learning to listen to your body. So you'll listen to your hunger cues and your fullness cues and what you want to eat and why you want to eat it and kind of put all of that into perspective away from diet and the diet mentality and social media of thinking that this, you know, little tiny skinny girl in a bikini is how we should all look. So it's really just getting in touch with your body and self care is a big part of it and compassion and self love all kind of falls into place as you work through it. And it's a long journey, but once you kind of learn how to be an intuitive eater, you don't have to worry about food so much. So a lot of people yeah. that may have like, disordered eating patterns or just a bad relationship with food really do well once they can become an intuitive eater. So it's, su it's super interesting. What do you think about that with, um, with extreme children? 
So I think that it's difficult with extreme children, especially if we are guided to do elimination diets and things like that, which we've talked before is not my favorite thing, unless sure. it's absolutely necessary. I think that we can avoid those kind of um, restrictive diets because even in extreme children, once you start restricting later down the road, it can lead to binge eating sure. or foods and insecurities, bad relationships with food. Mm -hmm. And so I think as parents, it's extremely important that we just, you know, pay attention to mindfulness. And then we talk about food for what it is, texture and temperature, and we get rid of the bad food, good food labels. You know, it's, it's totally okay to have a piece of cake. But when we have the piece of cake, let's taste it and enjoy it and be grateful for it instead of just thinking, oh my gosh, I have to eat this because I'm never going to get another piece of cake again. I had a piece of cake today and I did both enjoy it and appreciate it. It was Absolutely. delicious. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> Actually, I'm uh, with my best friend and she took me to a new keto cafe in town. Oh. And this couple is so sweet and they make keto and non-keto desserts and all kinds mm -hmm. of food. But um, it was delicious, and I loved every second of it. I was not sad at all that I ate it. There, I see, and that's, appreciated it. <laughs> yeah, and that's how it should be. You should be able to eat food, the body that or the food that your body wants, and not feel guilty about it. I but did you know, it, when and my body not. did want that piece of chocolate cake, there and I'm so happy about it. <laughs> yeah, and so then that's perfect, right? Yeah, I didn't yeah. eat the whole cake. I ate a piece, not even that's, the whole thing, actually. Yeah, it was good. That sounds um, like some great intuitive eating to me. I was so intuitive. I feel <laughs> I feel more intuitive right now just thinking about it. <laughs> um, okay, so talk to us about like, um, I know that you work a lot, like you said, with the mental health aspect of, of nutrition. So is, as far as the idea of treating the whole body, like how does our diet play into our mental health and how can we, I know that there have been so many memes and we've joked so much and I have personally today joked with my friend about like, how could I squeeze my butt right now into my jeans after COVID? Right. So right. talk to us about like all these, all of us that have sat and just ate bags of chips while we watched TV because we, there was nothing to do. Yeah. Like, how does that kind of all play together? So first of all, like that, you know, right now we're all going through something we've never went through before. So that emotional eating or that bored eating is I'm not going to say normal, but it, you know, it's, it's pretty common across the board. You know, almost everyone I've talked to is like, oh my gosh, I just feel like I'm eating more than I used to. And if you think about it, the way that, you know, that our body is, you know, evolved from, you know, say cavemen, if we were in a place where we were unsure what was going to happen in the future, we would eat every single calorie we could because we're unsure and we're, we were anxious and there's fear about the future. And so sure. our bodies are naturally doing the things that they're supposed to do. We just feel bad about it because social media tells us to, mm -hmm. right? So I think that a lot of the mental health, you know, that it's really a hot topic right now, you know, it's because we're all social isolated. We're worried about our kids' mental health. So I think that one of the biggest misconceptions about mental health is that it's separate from physical health or spiritual health. You know, when you're looking at health um, from like a medical perspective, they look at five aspects. So they look at your physical health, your emotional health, your uh, mental health, your spiritual health, and your social health. To me, all of those are mental health, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we're in physical pain, it's going to cause mental health issues. Sure. Um, if we're spiritually, you know, suffering, then that's going to link to mental health. And obviously emotional health, you know, is, is the same thing as mental health. So I think this idea that there's this separation causes a lot of misconceptions. And whether, you know, you know, they're trying to really bring it to the forefront, but there's still stigma involved. Of course. So, you know, people are, are afraid to go to a therapist. Mm -hmm. People are worried they're going to be labeled. And as extreme parents, we know about the labeling thing, like, sure. you know, and that's the same thing I think that we fear is that, you know, going to a mental health professional or, you know, trying to deal with our mental health, may, you know, shows there's a yeah. problem that we're sometimes trying to deny and sure. hide, you know. So I think that that, you know, that misconception and that that stigma holds a lot of people back from trying to really support their mental health. Yeah. So do you have recommendations for those of us that do feel like, man, we're just feeling all wonky because we've eaten whatever, we haven't worked out, we have all the gyms are closed. I mean, I say that as if it sounds like I went to the gym before I did not. I don't want to yeah. give the wrong impression. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 
I know there are a lot of people that just feel like, like for my husband, he's super into physical health. That is a yeah. way he keeps himself mentally healthy. Yeah. And so he's been really, um, it, intentional about like biking a couple times a week and he gets up at the butt crack of dawn to make sure he does it, but that's the time he has to do it. So that's totally mm-hmm. fine. Or he'll go out and he's made a little like home gym in our barn. And so he'll go out and spend time out there, which is totally fine. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm somebody that my mental health needs a nap or a yeah. long bath. It does not involve a lot of sweat for right. me personally. Yeah. <laughs> but what are things that we can do just to kind of protect that sanity? Because I know that I've noticed I feel a lot more exhausted and prone to anxiety and depressive seasons during this last several months when I'm like, how am I making this choice? How, like I will make a choice and then 100% talk myself out of that choice in that like 12 hours time span until I wake up the next morning and I'm like, Oh, we have to do the opposite thing now. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure my husband wants to divorce me because he's like, you are crazy. I can't keep going back and forth. Right. Like this. So help yeah. us understand like, what are some things that we can do to help ourselves? Yeah. Right now? So the biggest thing is you got to give yourself a break. Like, like say, okay, it is okay that I don't know. And it is okay that I'm anxious. And then, you know, deal with it that way. Um, I think that for a lot of us, we don't recognize those patterns or we'd like to say we want to hide from them. Um, if, if I'm feeling super anxious about something, I kind of want to hold it in and not let sure. everyone else know. Um, number one, if you don't have a therapist or a mental health professional, get one. Mm-hmm. Like I literally tell every single one of my clients to get a, a therapist or talk to someone at church. Um, you know, you talking to your best friend is, is fantastic, but sometimes you need that little push that they can kind of, you know, get into areas that you didn't sure. know were there and work it out. Um, some other things that we can do nutrition wise. So um, gut health is super important. So the gut, you know, now they're saying the gut is actually the, the first brain yes. and the brain is the second brain. And so everything we're doing literally starts in the gut. So um, we need uh, neurotransmitters. The way that we produce neurotransmitters is eating protein. So if you're not getting enough protein in the day, then you're not, you're not creating all of those neurotransmitters that are going to help produce our serotonin and our dopamine and all melatonin, all the things that are going to help us be happy or focus or sleep. Um, I'm going to need- feed my kid an entire turkey after this. Right. I feel like that is so important. I'm like thinking in my head, like, what can I shove down Briggs's gullet that will make him chill the heck out? It's got the tryptophan in it. It's got the yes. um, protein. You're to like, sleep. yeah. Um, and then when it comes to mental health, there's a couple key nutrients that we want to make sure we're getting, um, a, you know, a good amount of. So B6 is a huge one. Um, if you're taking a multivitamin, it's probably in there. Um, zinc and copper are going to be important. So if you feel like you're off a little bit mental health wise, you can always ask your doctor about that. Um, I have a client who was having extreme anxiety, like, you know, several panic attacks a day. And we went and sent her for blood work and she had copper toxicity. And that was what was causing the anxiety the whole oh, time wow. for years, for like nine years, she's had this anxiety and we've, you know, evened it out with some zinc and now she doesn't have panic attacks anymore. So a lot of times your mental health comes from more than just the point that you're sure feeling stressed or fearful, things like that. Um, so micronutrients, you know, you're, that you're going to get from your plants, your fruits and your vegetables, all of those are key nutrients to your you know, mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, hydration, nobody drinks enough water that I know ever. So um, I read this amazing statistic the other day that if you're, if you're dehydrated even 30%, that your brain's only functioning at like 70%. Hmm. So, you know, getting enough water is going to be super important. Um, and then we also, when, I want to kind of go back to the therapist thing, because there's this huge correlation that I wanted to point out for us and for our children between IBS um, and mental health issues. And that connection comes from a lot of times from people that had trauma as a child. Yeah. So if they had like adverse childhood experience, so that could be, you know, abuse or loss of a parent or Mm -hmm. even something like food insecurity could lead to digestive issues down the road that could lead to mental health issues. Sure. So that's an important thing to kind of consider if you, um, you know, have untreated mental health or trauma that you haven't worked through and you're having a hard time with digestion. Mm -hmm. and mental health, there could be a connection there. I think it's important to note with that also is, and I try to talk about it a lot 
you, I tend to gravitate towards writing about and talking about a lot of things as I'm researching it or as I'm going through figuring those things out, whether we're navigating a new diagnosis or whatever. And so mm -hmm. I know I just got my PTSD diagnosis in the last year. And mm -hmm. then on top of that was a C CPTSD diagnosis. And I was like, yeah, you're just saying letters at this point. I don't really know what you're talking about. And so I kind of really went down the rabbit hole of, of investigating that further. Yeah. And it was really, that was very relevatory for me because I didn't know in my brain, I only knew PTSD as something that soldiers returning from war right. suffered from. Yeah. And then I started learning about traumatic brain injury and I was like, okay, so that explains a lot, but I don't have either one of those. So I don't understand and then, you know, my therapist talked to me a lot about like big T and little T trauma and like how we basically mm -hmm. say, well, these things didn't happen to me, so I should be able to deal with it. I should be able right. to let it go. I should be able to handle it or whatever. And I think, you know, there's something to be said for people that are parenting extreme children and being, an, even if our child will at one point in their life be able to sort of function on their own or to some extent be independent, yeah. we're still caregivers lifelong. And so because we have to sort of have that hyper vigilance to be on all the time for our kids, there is a mental component for us, a mental health component mm -hmm. that does not exist when you're raising a neurotypical child. So right. what are some ways that we can kind of supplement? Like, are there, you know, I know that a lot of people talk about doing yoga and kind of doing things that get you centered, whether you're meditating or whatever. Um, or, or getting enough rest. That's a big one, which yeah. I think is sort of elusive to the extreme parent for most it of is. us, at least. Yeah. Um, um, talk about that a little bit, because I think that's something that's important for us to kind of take note of. Yeah. So yoga and meditation are absolutely like 100% one of the best things you can do. Having time to do that is a whole nother question. Sure. So um, I had posted, I think on the, the extreme parenting page the other day, like that shine app, Mm -hmm. there's apps like that, which have a mental health component. Like every day it has something that you kind of journal about mm -hmm. kind of think deeper into the situation and it's got meditations and it's got, um, mindful exercises, like when you're brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're already brushing your teeth. You might as well turn on the meditation and right. you know, you don't have to be sitting in your chair, cross-legged in a dark room with quiet to meditate. You can do it outside. You can, you know, so you have to might, you know, baby be creative. Sure. Um, but, you know, meditation is, you know, science proves that it helps. So we know that that, you know, that's something that you can do. I feel like, you know, time for yourself is going to be crucial. And if that means giving the child 15 more minutes on the computer so right. that you can sit for 15 minutes, just do it and don't feel guilty about I it. I totally agree with that. Yeah. And we've tried one thing because um, we, I was just talking to my friend about this today, like, we've our new normal at our house was after our, my husband got laid off because of mm -hmm. COVID. We, it was just like, all of a sudden we're always to get like all of us, all four of us are together. And that is a big adjustment yeah. when you're not used to that when everybody's always working. And yeah. so he started doing, I look, this body is built for a lot of things and yoga isn't one of them. <laughs> um, and so Spence has been doing yoga with the kids in the morning and they really love it. Mm -hmm. And it's really good for him to kind of get himself calm. And yeah. he's a very physical person, as is our extreme child. And so that kind of just like tactile um, and sensory input is really important for them. Mm -hmm. But involving Briggs and other things that I do, like if I'm going to just relax, if I'm going to do a breathing exercise or something that's maybe more geared towards mindfulness, mm -hmm. he'll slow down and do that with me, whereas he can't do it with his dad. Yeah. And so... so when you can't get five minutes by yourself, do your best to incorporate your child and see yeah. if they can kind of do as much as they're able to handle. Yeah. And that's what, you know, Aiden and I meditate together before bed at night and you know, he doesn't sit still, he's doing his thing, but he at least listens to the meditation mm -hmm. and we sit together. We've got that, you know, 10 minutes together mm -hmm. at the end of the day and it sparks some good conversation, For you sure. know? And so that, you know, that's definitely, if you, you know, if you can incorporate now, if it's going to cause more stress to incorporate them, then don't, you know, right, right. whatever you need to do. But yeah, that's definitely a good way to, um, you know, to kind of wind down. 
Um, you know, you, you said something about journaling. Um, I like to keep a notebook beside the bed because I get the, like, the bajillion thoughts of what I need to do, or I'll think of a blog, or I'll think of something, and so I'll write it down and get it out of my head. That way I don't have to lay there for three hours thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, movement is going to be super important, so whatever that looks like. I'm not saying go run a marathon. I'm not, you know. Don't worry, I will not. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> Me either. Um, so, you know, I don't like to exercise and some people do. So for me, I ha when I f have to force that exercise, I don't like it. So I like mm -hmm. to do things like walk through the neighborhood right? or go, you know, go for, you know, a hike somewhere that's not strenuous or exactly. go play in the river. Yeah. Um, and that's, okay. you know, whatever movement looks like for you that you enjoy, go for it. Don't force yourself because you think that you need to exercise into doing something you're not enjoying. Right. Then you're going to create a bad relationship with the exercise. And that's kind of like moving away from the mindfulness and the intuitiveness of it. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, okay, so you and I were talking about healthy lunches. Mm -hmm. And of course, I invite people to speak like two months in advance. So healthy lunches looks a little different now that people are going to probably be at home and things are a little different. And yeah. I will just be honest with you. I was having a full conversation today about how my grocery bill makes me want to cry real tears Yeah. because my kids eat all the food. Last night, I literally said to my husband, when he said something about dinner, I said, I feel like we just ate dinner. Like, why do I have to cook dinner? <laughs> why do you need right. to eat every night? <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, talk to us a little bit about some tips for healthy eating, but in an intuitive eating that's not going to stress us the heck out. Okay. Yeah. So when you had told me that, you know, you'd asked me to talk about healthy lunches all week, I was like, how am I going to do this? Because this is just not real right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I came up with a few things for if you're sending your kid to school and if you're doing homeschooling or virtual learning. <laughs> um, so the one thing I wanted to mention is that like, if you're sending your kid to school, it's going to be crazy, right? They're, it's going to be, they're, full of unknowns. They're going to be fearful. So lunch might be the only comforting thing they get all day. So if they're picky, just send them what they want. If you know, don't worry about the carrot sticks and the grapes, like just send whatever makes them feel good because right now Absolutely. it might be the only comforting thing that happens. They're going to have to eat alone at their desk. They're going to, you know, yeah, there, there's going to be all these rules. They're not going to know what to do. Nothing will just, look the same as they yeah, used to. Yeah, for just sure. Just send whatever they want, you know. Um, That's really brilliant. I love that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, later down the road, if, you know, things get back to normal, then you can worry about carrot sticks. And, right. You know, I was like, you see like the memes of like the first day of school and they have like dinosaur sandwiches yeah. and stuff. You're like, <laughs> whatever. That's not going right. to happen this year. That's just, you know, um, and like put a little note in there. Like the first day of school is going to be crazy for kids. Right. Like, like I said, who wants to eat at their desk by themselves six feet away from their friend? I know. Like, it's not going to be fun. Um, you know, if you, I don't know how other schools are doing it, but like our son, he has to have his backpack with this stuff. He doesn't get a locker or anything. They have to keep it with them. So just think about shel shelf stable lunches. So like he likes ham and cheese with no mayonnaise. So I'll like make it the night before and leave it in the fridge. And I feel like it's pretty safe till he eats mm -hmm. lunch. Um, but most of your fruits and stuff like that are going to be okay for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like grapes and, you know, like yeah. little cutie oranges and things like that. Um, you know, you can do fruit roll-ups, uh, fruit snacks. Um, and there's a lot of brands now that are not doing no food dyes. So if that's something you're avoiding, that's easier to find than it used to be. Um, we talked about the first time you were with us, but just to reiterate, if you have not researched food dyes, do it. Do it. Because I can tell you, take it to the bank 10 times out of 10. If my son eats red dye 40, he is going to act like cuckoo could chew within mm -hmm. an hour. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you have any questions, just, yeah, send me a message or something too, because I'll be more than happy to help yes, anybody with that. Sure. Um, so, you know, like crackers and stuff, they like goldfish are made with whole grains now. Cheese it's like, you know, just do the best you can. Right. Um, you can always think about thermoses if they do like soup or something like that. I mean, my son eats the same thing every day for every meal, so I don't get to send things like soup to school. Right. <laughs> but if your kid does, I mean, those are good ways to do it. The main thing to think about is that they're probably not going to be able to get help opening it. So if it's in a container that it's prepackaged, make sure that if they can't open it, you put it in something they can open. That is so smart. Um, because they, they, they may not be able to have a teacher help them or you may not want the te you know, mm -hmm. other people touching their food. Um, you know, put a little hand sanitizer in their lunchbox. So that you can, you know, 
make sure they know how to use it. That stuff's going to be super important. Um, get them a water bottle and write their name on it and send that to school because I don't know, most of the schools are doing no water fountains. Yeah. Um, so if you, you know, you can take a water bottle, freeze a little bit of water in it overnight. That way it stays cold for them all day. Mm -hmm. Make sure, you know, they know not to share water bottles, things like that, but that's going to be super important so that they're not having to use that refillable water fountain. Yeah. Um, if your kid gets, you know, free or reduced lunch and you plan on them eating at school, um, I've done quite a bit of research on most of the school districts and a lot of them are leaning towards prepackaged items. So it'll be things like Uncrustables, mm -hmm. string cheese, um, prepackaged apples, Doritos, goldfish, mm -hmm. you know, so if your child's super picky, think it, you know, it's not going to be like hot lunch. Yeah. Now some schools may, but it's not going to be like hot pizza like it used to be right i told my husband it's gonna be like gel house style like they bring you the tray oh, yeah. and it's gonna be like a crappy sandwich and like an apple yeah for sure <laughs> it's definitely gonna be different yeah um so if you're staying home with your kids or you're doing virtual learning um you know make sure that you give plenty of time for lunch so that mindfulness thing comes in you don't want to hurry um make sure they have time to you know, relax for a few minutes after they eat because we have to rest to digest. Mm -hmm. So if we start running as soon as we eat our lunch, we're not going to digest the way that we're, that we should. Um, I'm sure that you can turn cooking into class time, right? You kind of talked about that the other day on your post. So it will you know, talk try your patience as God is my witness. It is yeah. not the easiest thing I've ever done, but my kids really like it. It's good sensory, honestly, yeah. for both of our kids. It's really good for sensory input. And then we teach measurements. That's about the only math that I'll do. Yeah. <laughs> My husband is, that's his area, but, um, yeah. but they really do a good job with that. And it's really cool for them to like, get to be a little bit creative in that. Yeah. That and you can spark the intuition. So we're born as an intuitive eater, you know, kids are intuitive eaters until we tell them that they're not anymore by, you know, giving them diets and, you know, telling them foods are bad. So when they're eating, talk about temperature, texture, the taste, the sounds that the food makes. How does it smell? How does it feel in your throat? You know, how does it feel in your stomach? Um, you can talk about, you know, food being your energy source and talk about how it makes you feel in two hours. So, you know, we ate grapes for a snack. Do you feel like you have more energy? You know, things like that, that they, they can help them learn about food you know, so it doesn't just turn into the, you know, you know, a lot of us just eat out of habit because we're supposed to, it's lunchtime. So you eat, mm -hmm. you know, instead of really thinking about why we're eating the food, um, you know, kind of being grateful for the food, you know, we used yeah. to, you know, bless our food or, you know, a lot of people still do, but do you really like think about where it came from and right. like, you know, I think it's important too to foster a healthy relationship with food for, yeah not just our daughters. I think that's kind of how, what we're supposed to, we think that we're supposed to do, but yeah. also whether it's our daughters or sons or for like a uh, sensory sensitive kiddos is to make them aware of what agrees with them more. So yeah. like when our son was really little, we used to have to put his, well, he still eats off divider plates, which full disclosure, I would too, if they made them for adults. Um, <laughs> they do, but he, okay. They make them for adults. I'm telling you, I don't like myself to touch, but he would, we'd have to put his food, didn't matter if we, how long we'd cooked anything, we'd have to put it in the freezer before he would eat it. Mm. And so that was a big kind of topic of conversation is like putting what we like to call sort of gentle boundaries around things or expectations mm -hmm. for him and then let him kind of navigate and figure it out for himself. Yeah. Like, why don't I like this or why? Because he, he will make up these whole stories about like, oh yeah, I tried that at school. I'm like, listen, I am 100% certain they don't serve hummus at your school. So you lie. Right. But, you know, we just yeah. have to kind of sort that out. But yeah, I, I agree. And I think like giving them that healthy aspect of like, this sounds good to me. Why do I feel like it's fueling my body? It's mm -hmm. like, what, or am I just bored or sad or whatever? What, what emotion are you feeling when you're eating? Right. And something that we can do is, you know, for ourselves, if we feel like we're eating emotionally or eating out of boredom, and you can do this with your kids too, which Aiden does it. He'll come down and he's just bored. He thinks he just needs something to eat. So something you can do is, you know, if you decide that you're going to eat and you're not hungry, that's the first question. Am I hungry? I mean, you, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't feel the hunger, then you're probably eating for another reason. So the best thing to do is set a timer for five minutes and sit and think about why you want to eat it. 
And that's what we do with a lot of people that are, you know, working on eating disorders. You know, like think about if you don't need it, why do I, what, why do I want it? I yeah. want it because I'm bored. I want it because I'm feeling super anxious, you know, yeah. and kind of let you get in touch with your feelings for a few minutes. And then if you still want it, then eat it. Sure. But the point is to figure out, navigate why you're, why yeah. you're craving it. You know, we think that, you know, craving things is bad. If you're craving salt, there's probably a reason that, you know, that you sure. need salt. So just because you're craving something sweet doesn't mean that that's bad, but it's really important to get in touch with why, why do I feel like I need a, you know, that I need a piece of cake? You know, cause I just want it or, you know, right. I'm celebrating or, you know, really, you know, digging deep into why you want it. Yeah, right. absolutely. Um, you are such a wealth of information. I am so grateful for you. Yeah, um, glad to be here. Okay. So really quickly, and I will put it in the comments as well. Tell everybody where they can, I know that you're in our group. So you're yeah. in the extreme parenting group, which is awesome, but tell everybody where they can find you if they want to connect with you to set up a virtual class or like a session with you, or how can they get a hold of you? Um, so I've got a website. It's, um, www.socialsnutrition.com. So we'll post it. Um, I've also got a Facebook page for intuitive eating, which I had posted a few weeks ago, but I'll repost it. In yeah, the group definitely if anyone's interested, it's totally free and we're just really getting started. So if you are interested in it, I'm doing a lot of handouts and, you know, journal prompting and There's things like great. that. I, you guys, it's all, it, I've loved the prompts. That's really made me yeah. really kind of like second guess why I'm doing certain things, yeah. which has been pretty cool. And I'll put some, um, I, the one thing we didn't really talk about that I was going to mention is, um, so you're the, if you're feeling super stressed and anxious, there is your vagus nerve that runs from your brain to your gut. And there's a few things you can do to stimulate that, that help you to, um, stop the fight or fight response and kind of slow your stress response down. Mm -hmm. And I may, I have a handout for it. So I'll post that too. Awesome. But there's some things you can do like humming and singing and gargling and things like that, that kind mm -hmm. of just like activate that, um, connection between your brain and your gut. Mm -hmm. So I'll post that too. So that's some, you know, ideas for mental health. Will you please related. also text my husband? That is why I will be singing this week because my <laughs> kids constantly remind me, I do not have a voice of an angel, which they're dead wrong about. <laughs> and so I was just flexing these golden pipes and telling them I am just connecting my vagus nerve right now. You yeah, guys just, just working on my mental health, <laughs> singing as loud as I can. Yes. yes. I love it. I, I feel like I sound very Aguilarian myself personally, but <laughs> they don't agree. Whatever. <laughs> Aiden's got into rapping. So now I can just, he has headphones on Perfect. just rapping away. And I'm like, oh, I love it. Great. Vegas He's nerve going to have to teach Briggs. It'll be so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Amy, thank you so much for taking your time to talk to us. Yeah. Definitely post that stuff. And you guys that are watching this on playback, I will post in the comments, the Solstice Nutrition um, website, as well as Amy's Facebook, because it is awesome. It's such a wealth of information. Thank you. Um, I can't wait till we get to talk again. It's going to be yeah. so awesome. All right. I'll talk All to right. you. All right. Talk to you later. You. Bye.